Hi everybody. One of the video requests I get from a lot of people is, Jason, when are you going to create a video on how to meditate and more specifically, how to meditate properly? Now, I've probably avoided this video for a long time because there's a lot to unpack. As you know, when I go into a topic, I dive deep and meditation is a deep topic because there are a lot of things you need to understand. You need to understand that there is a philosophy also behind meditation, but also there are a lot of techniques behind meditation that we need to explore. And I'll explore all of that today and I'll give you the inside information on how to dive deep into your meditation. But first, what is meditation? A lot of people don't really understand what meditation truly is. Now to understand meditation, we need to understand the objective of meditation, which is Chitta Vritti Naroda, which is the cessation of the whirlpools of the mind, which is the cessation of the mental activity within our mind, making our mind purely reflective and transparent, completely still. So chitta here means mind or consciousness. Vritti means the whirlpools of the mind or the, or the constant activity of the mind. And naroda means the settling or the stilling. So this is the settling or the stilling of the mind. And this is the core objective of meditation. We are trying to stop the actual movements of the mind or the movement of the mind. We're not trying to do anything other than that. We're trying to bring our mind back into equanimity so then we can come into contact with something much deeper within ourselves, which is a part of ourselves that we often ignore. And this is the core objective of meditation. So one of the misconceptions about meditation is people think meditation is about stopping thoughts. Now, you know, in me saying Chitta Vritti Naroda, there is the idea of stopping thoughts, but it's the cessation of mental activity, not just thoughts, just the movement of the mind in general. Now, in practicing meditation, the end of thoughts will be a result. Stopping thoughts may come as a result of prolonged meditation, but we shouldn't go into meditation thinking that meditation's objective is to stop thoughts. It is not. What we are doing in meditation is we are mindfully noticing distractions, which includes thoughts. And in mindfully noticing distractions, this brings us back to the object of our meditation. This is the point of meditation, or this is the fundamental technique or practice in meditation, is we're mindfully noticing distractions. And that's, like I said, including thoughts, including sounds, sensations in the body, we're noticing all of this. And what we are doing when we notice this is we're trying to always bring ourselves back to our anchor or our object of meditation, and, and I'll discuss that later. And that can vary with different traditions and so forth and so on. But that's what we are trying to do. We're noticing these distractions. So we're not trying to set out to stop thoughts. We're trying to notice that thoughts themselves are just distractions from who we are in this present moment as pure awareness and always have been pure awareness. And it is only our thoughts that distract us from this center within us. Now, to achieve that, what do we need to do? Well, we need to understand that there is a fundamental problem that we all suffer from. And the problem is concentration. We've never been taught how to concentrate. We don't know what it is. We're constantly told by our parents, you know, you should concentrate. Jason, concentrate on your homework. Focus. And you don't know what the hell they're talking about. You don't know what they mean by it. You, can, you have an idea, but you've never been taught actually how to concentrate. That's the problem. You've never been taught how to concentrate. And our parents and all of these other teachers and that, that tell us to concentrate, they themselves have not been taught as well. So we've all been criticized from birth for not concentrating from people who themselves don't know how to concentrate. So it's a constant loop of a lack of understanding of what concentration is. And to understand meditation, we have to understand concentration. We have to understand what it is and how to cultivate concentration. Because without concentration, meditation is impossible. So to achieve this, we need a systematic approach to meditation, which is a combination of a ancient philosophy with ancient meditative techniques. 
Now, what I'm going to explain to you today is, is the mixture of some expert schools of meditation. And because I teach Eastern philosophy, I understand what works and what is practical and what also allows people to go deeper in their meditation. And I've been teaching this system for a long period of time, going on 10 years now, and I know it works, so it works for myself, and it works for everyone else. And what this approach includes is a mix of yoga philosophy, Theravada Buddhism, and Zen Buddhism. And so we'll get into that, but primarily we're going to be following yoga philosophy as the sort of general foundation philosophy of our meditation practice, but the techniques will depend on Theravada Buddhism and Zen Buddhism because they have some of the best and most efficient and the most profound meditative techniques in the entire world. So you could say that the system we follow is yoga philosophy and the practical application of our meditation depends on Theravada Buddhist and Zen Buddhist techniques. And as I said before, there is a method to my madness and why I synthesize these three traditions because they are expert systems of meditation and lifestyle and they actually work. And they also uncover a lot of things about meditation and our lifestyle which a lot of people overlook when practicing or trying to learn meditation. The philosophical framework of yoga includes eight limbs of yoga. This is called a Shtanga Yoga. Now, we're not going to unpack all eight limbs. We're going to use the last four limbs for our understanding of meditation because these four limbs are very important for your growth in meditation and how to go deeper into your practice. It doesn't mean the first four limbs are unnecessary, but these four contribute to meditation directly and they impact it in a positive manner and in a, in a profound manner. So these last four limbs are prachahara, sense withdrawal, dharana, concentration, jhana, meditation, and samadhi, contemplation. Now, these are simplistic translations of these four limbs, but we'll unpack each of them to understand them deeper. But you need to first understand that Prachahara, the fourth, is one of the outer limbs of the eight limbs of yoga. And Dharana, Jhana, and Samadhi are what we would call the inner limbs. They're working on the deep inner level. So the first four limbs of yoga they call the outer limbs, which I don't need to get into, but we do need to address Prachahara because Prachahara is perceived as the gateway to the inner limbs. And I'll explain why that is. Why Prachahara is considered the gateway to the three inner limbs of yoga is because it addresses the senses and the way that we act in our general life, our lifestyle. It addresses how we behave in general. So the way that we consume things through our eyes and ears, so through entertainment, the way what food and everything we eat, it's trying to address all of that. And Prachahara is about withdrawing from the senses. So withdrawing from this habit we have to feed our senses. We're trying to rein that habit in. This is what Prachahara is. Now, why this is important to your meditation practice is because the process of Prachahara begins the night before your practice. Now, I am assuming that all of you would practice meditation first thing in the morning because it is the best time to practice, even though any time is a good time to practice meditation. But if you're going to take meditation seriously, we should try and make a habit of meditating first thing in the morning. So what Prachahara does is it addresses the night before your practice. Now, a lot of people don't consider the night before their practice because they just think that they can do anything at nighttime, watch Netflix, uh, gorge on snacks, have a glass of wine, so forth and so on, have a coffee, and this is not going to impact their meditation practice the following morning. Eh, wrong. You've got to 
base understanding of meditation. Pratyahara is about addressing that night before. It's about understanding that what we do in our life the night before meditation is going to impact our meditation practice and how deep and easily we can dive into our meditation. There is actually a science behind what I am speaking about, this process of Pratyahara the night before or this process of Pratyahara in life in general. And it has to do with the nervous system. Now, why it relates to the nervous system is because when we look at the autonomic nervous system, there are two branches of the autonomic nervous system. There is the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now, the sympathetic nervous system is what we activate when we're constantly doing. We're doing, 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 doing. And when we overactivate the sympathetic nervous system, this is what leads to burnout, anxiety, stress, and so forth and so on. We're constantly on. Now, the parasympathetic nervous system is what we activate when we are completely at rest. We activate this deeply through meditation. We activate this when we sleep. And we activate this when we are just basically just chilling out and doing nothing. Now, when I say doing nothing, I mean literally doing nothing. Because a lot of people say that they're going to chill out and, and they're going to do nothing. But then they might scroll their social media feed or they might watch TV or they might go to a music concert or they might have a lengthy conversation with their friend. This is all activating the sympathetic nervous system and not the parasympathetic nervous system. Though you may feel good from these activities, you are still on to a certain degree. And this is a problem for your meditation practice because we need to be able to turn this on switch off and completely dive deep in meditation. So what Prachahara addresses is this bad habit we have of fueling our senses the night before our meditation practice and keeping our sympathetic nervous system turned on and activated. It's far better to activate our parasympathetic nervous system the night before so that we can easily go into meditation and dive deep the following morning. So to do this, we need to fast the mind the night before. And I speak about this a lot in my book, Fasting the Mind. Now, to achieve this, we need to have some sort of strategy to fast our mind. The first process we should follow is digital sunsets. Now, digital sunsets was inspired by professor of computer science and anti-social media advocate, Cal Newport. Now, why this is important is because what we do in digital sunsets is around five or six o'clock in the afternoon, and Cal Newport follows this process, is you turn all digital devices off and you just live your life, read a book, maybe speak to your wife or husband, maybe have a simple conversation and just have all of this digital technology turned off. Now, what Cal does you know, he has a little mantra around five or six o'clock where he goes shut down complete. And that's when he turns his computer off and he goes home and he lives his life with his wife and his children. Now, why this is important is because digital technology also impacts our sympathetic nervous system and our meditation the following day because it ultimately affects our sleep. And why it affects our sleep is because of the blue light in a lot of digital technology, which tricks our pineal gland and stops it from secreting melatonin into our brain so we can get a good night's rest. It suppresses that process. And that's what blue light does. And that's why a lot of people have trouble after looking at their phone before bed or their computer and they can't sleep. It's because that's of that suppression of that secretion of melatonin into the brain. So this is a big problem, obviously, not just for your sleep patterns, but also for your meditation the following day. So. In the first strategy, we need to try and practice digital sunsets. So that means, as I said, turn all digital devices off around five or six o'clock or whatever you can achieve in your certain life circumstance. But this is very important for your meditation practice. So the next strategy is not involved with what we take in through the eyes and ears, but what we take in through the mouth. So it is important what we eat the night before. You don't want to have a lot of uh, spiced food. You don't want to have a, a very heavy carb meal. You want to have something light and nutritious, very wholesome that 
is going to contribute to a more balanced mind the day before. And to go with that, obviously we wanna try and avoid caffeine. So a lot of people get in the habit of even having coffee at nighttime these days. But we also want to avoid certain teas, like even green tea and this and that at night. And another one that we need to avoid is pretty much a no-brainer, which is alcohol. A lot of people may say, yeah, but I just, Jason, I just have one glass of wine a night. But that one glass can disrupt your sleep pattern, and that's going to affect your meditation practice the next day. And I know that might sound too strict, but if you're taking meditation seriously, then you have to implement that sort of practice you know avoiding a glass of wine one night or or two night or making it a habit all the time is not a bad habit to cultivate now the last strategy we want to implement is trying to sleep at a decent hour of the night now this will depend on your circumstance your working life and so forth and so on your family commitments but you still want to make a commitment to try and sleep at the most decent hour that you can because if we're not getting anywhere between that seven to nine hour range of sleep, which they say is healthy for us, it's very difficult to go deep into your meditation. Now you might say, I know what you're saying, I know what you're saying, that in monasteries and this and that, they might like say, for example, in a Zen monastery, they might have a session, which is a meditation retreat where you will go to bed at 10 at night and wake up at three. But you need to remember during that session, during that, retreat you're basically just meditating you're not going out and you know going to work and you're not conversing with people and solving problems all day you're doing completely nothing at those retreats which transforms you fundamentally but most of you watching here live a normal life and you need practical techniques so sleeping the the recommended seven to nine hours is very important for your meditation practice because i'm assuming that a lot of you do have jobs and you are busy and have family commitments and friends and so forth and so on you are living a life and you're not on a mountain um, as a sadhu or a yogi so we need to make that commitment too because because this is going to allow you to go deeper into your meditation practice if you do get that good night's rest that good night's sleep now why all of these strategies are very important and why prachahara is important to practice this process the night before is because that all of these contribute to having no attention residue now attention residue is what happens when we have things that we've seen before or unsolved problems or things that are affecting our present state so for example to explain attention residue if you are going to commit to writing a book this morning like you're going to start writing a book this morning but before you start writing that book you check your emails i've been guilty of this myself and try to avoid it as much as possible and you see some emails that need to be addressed but you've made this commitment to writing the book so you don't tackle them straight away what's what's going to happen here this is what attention residue is you go to start writing the book and in the back of your mind, they're still lingering. Those emails are lingering and inhibiting your writing session in the morning and inhibiting your skill as a writer. And you might start writing and you might take a while to get over it, but you're still not at a peak level of performance. And so we want to avoid attention residue as much as possible. And that's why Prachahara addresses that the night before. You're addressing digital technology, you're addressing how you are eating and what you're consuming, what beverages you're consuming, you're addressing your sleep, you're addressing these things that are going to help have a settled mind the next day. There's not going to be anything lingering in the mind. You're not going to have an email that you need to address. You're not going to have a a tweet that you want to shoot out you're going to have suppressed all that because it's you haven't even seen anything online you haven't even had the chance to accumulate any attention residue the night before and so this is why prachahara is extremely important to diving deeper into concentration dharana and jhana meditation and ultimately samadhi contemplation so ultimately, Prachahara trains your awareness to be more capable of concentration so that you can dive deep into meditation. So now we come to Dharana, concentration. We've addressed Prachahara. We've addressed all of these little things in our lifestyle that may inhibit our meditation practice. And we are getting down to the nuts and bolts of meditation, which is 
concentration. Now, dharana is literally defined as binding to a place. This is important to understand, binding to a place. What binding to a place means, or what the Rana means, is the willful engagement to an object of meditation or an anchor of meditation. It's the willful engagement in that process. And this idea of concentration, as I mentioned earlier, is very uncommon because the untrained mind is habituated to fluctuation. That's you know, your parents telling you to concentrate and focus and you don't know what the hell's going on and you're trying to because all of our minds are habituated to fluctuate. And this is the big problem. But what the runner teaches you is that through patience, perseverance and discipline, our mind can become habituated on staying on the object of meditation without fluctuating. And this leads ultimately to jhana. So heightened dharana breaks through to the deep meditative absorption of jhana. So now we come to jhana. Now, jhana, as I mentioned before, they translate it in general as meditation, but a better translation is meditative absorption. Now, jhana is defined in the yogic context as an extension of the unity of basis. This means that jhana is an extension of dharana. Which means jhana is a flowing process of concentration that develops after the dharana process of momentarily concentrating on an object. Jhana, meditation absorption, is the perfection of the process of habituation in concentration, dharana. Concentration then becomes continuous and sustained, leading to a much deeper and peaceful and blissful state of meditation. This is important because when we are in prolonged jhana or prolonged meditative absorption, then we begin to understand and come into contact with samadhi. Now, there are many ways to understand samadhi. A lot of people have differing ways to understand samadhi. But samadhi is basically something like contemplation or a tranquil ecstasy. Tranquil ecstasy, not ecstasy like blah, blah, blah. A tranquil ecstasy, a bliss state. A state where the idea of Jason has evaporated and ultimately where the idea of the object of meditation has disappeared. So in Samadhi, concentration is perfected to the point that the object of meditation drops away and all that is left is pure awareness, pure being. There is no identity of you or me or other things that is all dropped away and this is samadhi so all that is left is your serene awareness without any object of meditation and any mind activity in general this gives you the ability to realize your true nature your fundamental nature at your core which we won't give a name but you begin to come into contact with that and you can only come into contact by following this process that I'm talking about. This is the state of Ananda. Some would say Ananda is bliss, and it is. But I would say in this sense, this is the perfected consciousness. This is a consciousness not stained and quality-less. This is the true goal of meditation, where we get beyond all conception of what it is, and we come back into contact with who we truly are at the core of our being. But we won't give that a name, even though we can give it a name. We can call it Atman. We can call it, you know, all of these terms. But that's the goal of meditation is to come back. And that's why this philosophical system is very important to follow. So I hope you followed that along up until now. And now we're going to get into the meditative techniques which will be enhanced from following all of what I've said previously. Okay, now we finally come to the techniques of meditation and the things that we should consider when we want to meditate deeply. Now, there are a few things that we need to consider before we meditate. First of all, a no-brainer, a quiet place. Obviously, it's better to meditate in a quiet place. One time in Australia, I saw this guy trying to meditate in a pub and there was music blaring this and that and this is just silly and it looked just like posturing maybe you know I don't I don't know him personally but we don't want to meditate in a pub if you want to dive deep you need to find a quiet place or, or make a dedicated place in your house for meditation 
Which leads into another thing that we need to consider, which is atmosphere. Now, a lot of people wonder why atmosphere is important, but I've taken many people to places such as Bodh Gaya, right? We go to Bodh Gaya, we go to Mahabodhi Temple, sit under the Bodhi tree, and a lot of people say that this is the most transformative meditation practice of their entire life, and, and they're just overwhelmed by the experience, and, and I've experienced that many times myself as well. That's because the atmosphere is important. You know, at home here, at my home, I, I have a dedicated meditation room and I have this little shrine behind me and this builds the atmosphere for my own personal meditation practice. And so it is very important to have a good atmosphere, maybe light some incense, put on some candles, have some sacred objects, whatever sacred objects you are attracted to, maybe the Buddha or the yin yang or the om or whatever that may be. So yeah, remember always a quiet place and atmosphere, so important, so important. Next, we have to think about obviously posture. Now, when we talk about posture, you obviously want to have your back comfortably erect, not stiff, but comfortably erect. And for our legs, we have a few things that we need to consider and this will come down to what is most comfortable for yourself. So first of all, if you are a yogi, you can try the full lotus posture. For myself, I usually meditate in half lotus posture because it's the most comfortable for myself and can keep my mind focused on the job at hand. So half lotus posture. Then we also, you can also just sit cross-legged. Cross-legged is another way to sit and meditate. There is the Japanese style of sitting on the balls of the feet. You can actually put a cushion between the balls of your feet and your buttocks, and this can actually become a pleasant meditation experience, though it can put a bit of strain on your knees eventually. I, I used to tr practice a lot in the Japanese style because of Zen training, but I, I gravitated more to the half lotus posture. And if you can't achieve any of those postures, then just sitting in a chair is completely fine. But you don't want to try and lie down and doze off and fall asleep. Remember, that defeats the purpose of meditation. So you need to sort of have your back erect and put yourself in a certain, whatever posture is comfortable for yourself. Now, next you want to think about hand positions, how your hands want to be when you are meditating. Now, I have two hand positions or two mudras that you need to think about. The first one is the jhana mudra. Now the jhana mudra is basically just your right hand is laying in your lap and your left hand is resting on this right hand and your thumbs are kind of touching. This is one of the most comfortable meditative mudras and this is one that's followed a lot in Theravada Buddhism and I learned this from all my years in Thailand and this is actually still my go-to mudra when I meditate. It's the most comfortable. It allows your shoulders to be relaxed, but also your hands to be relaxed, but kind of not relaxed, if you know what I mean. They're kind of in a mid-between state. And this can actually facilitate deeper states of meditation because there may be a tiny little bit of tension there in this mudra that keeps your mind sharp and alert. Now, the next mudra, they call the cosmic mudra, and this is obviously popular in Zen. This is the mudra of pressing your two thumbs together, making a circle, resting your left hand into your right, and keeping a little bit of pressure there between the thumbs. And so you, you have this mudra. This is actually still a pretty comfortable mudra and one I enjoy. But a lot of people like this mudra because when you are starting to drift off with the mind, when you begin to wander with your thoughts, you can just come back and press that thumb against the other thumb and that kind of whips you back into action, so to speak. So these two mudras I highly recommend. There are plenty others, but these two are simple, easy to follow and facilitate deeper levels of meditation. Now, before all of the meditation techniques that I teach you today, it is important to do nine cleansing breaths before any of these meditation techniques. This is what I've been following for years. A lot of people don't do any form of breathing exercise before their meditation. And I think it's very important because these breathing techniques have the ability to settle your mind a little bit before meditation. For example, your mind might be a little bit agitated before meditation. And so nine deep cleansing breaths can at least help to offset 
that mental activity to help you dive deeper. Now to do these nine cleansing breaths, what we need to do is we need to breathe deeply into our abdomen and we need to kind of see the belly button rise out instead of breathing shallow up here in the shallow regions of the lungs. You want to try and breathe right deep down into the bottom area of the lungs that are usually starved of air because we are in this habit of breathing very shallow due to social stress, anxiety and so forth and so on. So you want to breathe really deep down into the lower abdomen and you want to hold it there for three to five seconds and then you want to breathe it all completely out. And remember, we're only breathing here in and out through the nose. We're not using the mouth. We're using the nose. So you want to breathe all of that out through your nose completely. Like, like not crazy. But you don't want to do this in a fast manner. You want to do this naturally and at a good slow speed. And so let's do this together now. We can do these nine cleansing breaths together now before we go into the techniques and you'll see how these nine cleansing breaths actually help you. So you ready? Let's go on the in breath. Now hold there. Breathe out. Breathe fully out and hold there for three to five seconds. Now let's breathe in and follow this process eight more times. Okay, so as you can tell from following those cleansing breaths, you could probably just keep doing those and fall into a deep meditation on its own. But this is just a good technique to kind of cleanse the activity in your mind, try to settle the mind that allows the efficiency of the other techniques to shine more that I'm about to teach you. The first meditative technique I want to teach you is Vipassana. Now Vipassana is a very popular technique and one of the more highly skilled techniques around the world. And Vipassana in Pali or Sanskrit means insight meditation or insight into your true nature. That's the point of this meditation. It's about getting a glimpse of your true nature or diving deep into your true nature. And a lot of people confuse Vipassana with Goenka's 10-day Vipassana retreats. 
That's Vipassana as well. But the original teaching of Vipassana is based on Anapanasati. And Anapanasati in Pali means awareness of respiration or awareness of breath. Now, this is what Vipassana is. Vipassana is the, is the awareness of the natural fluctuations of breathing. Now, you're not trying to control your breath here. This is what's important in Vipassana. And this is, this, is a, this is a trick. This is hard to do, actually, because when you start to become conscious of your breath, Sometimes you'll start to try and control it just naturally because you're, you're focusing and you're concentrating on your breath. But what you want to try to cultivate is a level of concentration where you're just aware of the natural in-breath and out-breath. Just your natural rhythms. This is what you're trying to become conscious of. Now, why this is important, why Anapanasati is important and the core instrument in Vipassana is because when you start to be aware of your breathing for long periods of time, you begin to become aware then of your sensorium, your sensations within the body. Now, why this is important is because when you become aware of the sensations, the sensations according to Vipassana are linked to the root of our subconscious, which we could call in Pali or Sanskrit, the samskaras, now, these samskaras are the mental impressions and the subliminal psychological imprints that we have accumulated throughout our lifetime since birth, which affect our uh, habits and tendencies, our vasanas, which affects our karma, our action. So this is why Vipassana is very important, because when we are addressing the sensorium, the sensory level, we are addressing the samskaras, which will then transform our habits and tendencies and then transform our actions and our unconscious actions in the world. So when you are aware of the breath, then you become aware then of the senses. And then when you place your awareness on the senses within the body, these sensations you have within the body, it may, there may be some subtle tension maybe in the body, you begin to dive deeper into your meditation and you begin to actually, according to Vipassana, address these samskaras, which is kind of like cleaning out the basement in your house. You're cleaning out the basement. There's a lot of accumulated rubbish over years. You've been living in this house and you've thrown all of your knickknacks and rubbish in the basement. And this is basically what you're doing. You're addressing the subconscious. And this is why Vipassana is one of the greatest meditative techniques. And what a lot of people don't understand about Vipassana, because people mistakenly believe it's just a 10-day course that Goenka made popular. But it's not. It's something you can practice every day. And this can be your meditation practice going forward. And this is actually my main meditation practice in the morning is Vipassana meditation. Though I do practice some of the other ones I'm about to speak to. But I highly recommend Vipassana as your go-to meditation practice. So in practicing Vipassana, as I said, you just want to be aware of the in-breath and out-breath naturally. Place your awareness there. As you see, you can easily slip into meditation. We've been talking about a lot of meditation. Maybe that's why you might easily fall into meditation because that's what we've been talking about. But you can see how it's easy to fall into meditation if you've addressed the other things I mentioned before, especially with Vipassana. If we've addressed Prachahara, we've taken care of all of that, then we can step into Dharana, Jhana and Samadhi in a more efficient manner, in a, in a manner that there's a higher possibility of attaining samadhi in your meditation practice. So you can see how Vipassana works and how it is efficient. The second meditative technique I want to talk to you about is a meditative technique that is very popular in Zen Buddhism. And this is called open awareness meditation. Now this is a lot different actually than Vipassana because you're not focused on the breath. What we're focused on here is observing 
thoughts. Now, the observation of thoughts is kind of what people think about when they think about meditation. So people are probably thinking about Zen open awareness and meditation when they're thinking about meditation. So the object of meditation here is the awareness of thoughts. Now, again, remember, we're not trying to stop the thoughts here. We're not trying to stop the thoughts. Remember, we're trying to notice distractions, which include thoughts, as I mentioned earlier in this video. So you want to become conscious of the activity in your mind and your thoughts thoughts and the stream of consciousness that's constantly flowing through all of us. Thoughts don't disappear. Don't ever listen to anyone who tells you that. Thoughts will never disappear. Even in a great sage and a great master, thoughts still arise, but they don't have influence over them and they don't grasp thoughts, you see? And this is the stage we want to get to. We want to be able to witness our thoughts like we witness the clouds in a beautiful blue sky. And that's how we want to really witness our thoughts. So in Zen open awareness meditation, we are comfortably and calmly just observing our thoughts. We're observing the mental activity in our mind. So just, just do that for like half a minute. Now, some say that this is an easy meditation to follow, but if you practice this long enough, you'll know it's not an easy meditation practice to follow. Like any meditation practice is actually pretty difficult to follow, especially this one, because when you start to, it's funny, there's, there's two things that can happen here. When you start to focus on your thoughts or you observe your thoughts, certain thoughts will bubble up. And the next minute, as the nature of the mind, we get distracted and then we start to wander with the thoughts. Our awareness starts to wander with the thoughts, especially if it's an attractive thought. <laughs> you know, if it's an attractive thought, then we begin to wander with it. Next minute, we, we have to snap ourselves out of it and realize that hey, we were drifting off with that, with that thought. And that's the negative aspect of it. But the positive aspect of it is the more you observe your thoughts, and this is the point of Zen Open Awareness Meditation, the more you observe your thoughts, the more you begin to see that thoughts just disappear. They come and go like a ghost. They just continually disappear. And the more you become skilled at this meditative practice, and the more you harness concentration through the philosophy that I mentioned earlier, the yogic philosophy I mentioned earlier, the more you'll be able to just witness the thoughts coming and going and just disappearing, and you won't be influenced by them and you will be out of the habit of wandering with the thought. This is what's very important in open awareness meditation and why it is one of the great meditation techniques in the world and one I highly recommend. And so I'm confident that if you practice this one as well, that this will lead to deeper states of meditation. The third meditation technique that I recommend is also another technique within Zen Buddhism. And this is the natural counting of breath, counting the inhalation and the exhalation, but naturally, and you're counting it. You're not just observing the breath as you do in Vipassana, you are kind of actively engaged with the breath here. Now, how this operates is that in the in-breath, you count one, out-breath, two, in-breath, three, out-breath, four, so forth and so on, so forth and so on. Now, when your mind begins to wander, then you have to bring it back to zero. You have to constantly bring it back to zero. Now, this process is training the mind on a subtle level to concentrate at a deeper level. Because what happens usually is that we'll get to like eight or 10, the next minute a thought has, has captured our awareness and we start to wander with it. We may even still be counting. And then next minute, oh, what the hell? <laughs> and so you go, back to, you go back to zero. You have to go back to zero. And it's kind of a game. It's a game, but it's a game that's hard to master because of the natural wandering of the mind. And so what you want to do with this meditation is you want to get to the stage where you get to the triple digit stage, the 100 stage, 
without having a thought. Now, in saying that, before you get to 100, the counting and the thoughts will have subsided because you are starting to enter into a meditation. You are starting to go deeper into your meditation. This is what usually happens. And so this could happen just after 50. You know, you could be counting your in inhalation and exhalation. And then just after 50, you could start to slip into a meditation and then you are not even counting anymore and you are just naturally breathing in and out without even focusing on that. You have just slipped into meditation. And this is the point of this meditation is to get into that deep meditative state and that's what this counting meditation facilitates. It facilitates that. And it facilitates that because it's training your concentration. It's training your concentration to get into that state of samadhi. Now, this is kind of a metaphor for the whole inner yogic stage because you have the dharana process. You're training your concentration. And then you start to effortlessly come in contact with the counting of the in breath breath and out breath and then next minute all of the counting and the object of meditation begins to fall away because you've slipped into samadhi and this is the process of the zen natural breath counting technique and i often use this one a lot when i first was introduced to meditation a long time ago i would practice this meditation and i still fall back on this one depending on the situation that I'm in, or maybe it's a, something to do with the mood I'm in. But this meditation practice is a highly skilled practice and I highly recommend it along with the other previous two that I've mentioned. Now, the last meditative technique I want to speak to you about is the floating tongue meditation, or we could say the sleeping tongue meditation to be more precise. Now, what this meditation technique involves is you want to basically allow your tongue to just float or rest in your lower jaw. Now, that seems strange, right? That seems strange. But why you want to do that is because a lot of tension and a lot of times when we're thinking, our tongue is usually active. It's usually tense and it's usually pressed under the front teeth, behind the front teeth, or up in the upper palate, it's usually tense and stiff, and we don't pay attention to our tongue a lot of the time. It's like paying attention to your breath, right? We don't pay attention to our breath a lot of the time, and at the same time, we don't pay attention to our tongue. And so this is a problem. So what we're addressing in the sleeping tongue meditation is we're addressing the tension in the tongue, and we're trying to make it relax, and we're trying to concentrate on the tongue we're trying to focus on the tongue and so i'm doing it now as I, i'm not talking very clearly <laughs> but when you do allow it to rest you, you actually instantly you feel that the tension begins to leave your body and then when you do it for an extended period of time you feel a very calm state throughout your body and your mind and this is why sleeping tongue meditation is important. And in saying that, you can practice sleeping tongue meditation with the three previous meditation techniques that I've mentioned. But if it's a little bit too much work to also concentrate on the tongue while focusing on the breath and so forth and so on, I wouldn't recommend it. But a lot of expert meditators will practice the sleeping tongue meditation with, say, Vipassana or Zen Open Awareness Meditation because it allows them to be more calm and to have less tension in the body and also, in some sense, allows them to focus on the other object of meditation, which may be Vipassana, which is the breath, or in Zen Open Awareness Meditation, which is the observation of thoughts. So it really depends on if you can handle two objects of meditation. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend it to a beginner, but maybe to maybe an expert meditator. But in saying that, you don't want to fill your plate up too much when you are meditating. So I would recommend that just practicing the sleeping tongue meditation on its own. Because it is a really good meditation. Because you're just focusing on the relaxation of the tongue 
and trying to get rid of the tension out of the tongue, which releases the tension within the mind and the body. It is amazing how the tongue is often linked to tension and overthinking. And a lot of people don't think about that or a lot of people don't believe that. But just experience it yourself. Experience for yourself going forward when you are under stress and you're thinking about a lot of things. Observe the position of your tongue and you will notice that, wow, for some reason the tongue is tense. Why is it all tensed up? It has nothing to do. <laughs> I am stressed. My mind is stressed. Why is the tongue stressed? So this meditation technique is a highly skilled technique. And these are the four techniques that I highly recommend. There are many, many meditation techniques that I can mention, but these four are highly skilled meditation techniques, but also simplistic. They are equally efficacious and they are also not that hard to follow. So this is why it's important. They are very transformative and easy to follow. And that's why I highly recommend these four. And these four I have come into contact with for a long, long, long time. And by following these techniques, along with the yogic philosophy of the four limbs that I mentioned to you about the way to harness and understand concentration, this is an expert system. This is a systematic approach to meditation that actually works and it's one that you can keep going forward and you won't drift away from because you have a philosophical framework that you can lean on and you also have the techniques necessary to dive deep into your mind and experience samadhi. So I hope you all got a lot out of this today. And it's one I've been mulling over for a long, long period of time because I know a lot of people ask about it. So I hope that you have enjoyed the information that I've shared with you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Shanti, shanti, shanti.